Health, our job is to work with employers to keep their employees uh, safe and healthy. A lot of the questions I've been getting when I've been meeting with employers lately is about the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. So I've asked you, Dr. Diamond, to have a conversation about the COVID, COVID vaccine. There's a lot of information out about the COVID vaccine, but it's not always very easily understandable. Sure. So um, Dr. Diamond is one of our very popular and loved and trusted uh, family practice physicians. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice? Sure, yeah. So I've been here at Iowa Specialty for, oh, seven years now, and I've worked in um, dabbled in inpatient when I first started ER, um, delivered babies for my first five years. Um, then we opened this clinic up here a little over two years ago now in Garner. So now I'm most entirely family practice, um, full spectrum family care from the Garner location. Um, as far as educational background, I um, am, was born and raised in Iowa. I went to college out in Portland, Oregon, um, came back to Creighton and Omaha for med school, and then finished up at Research Family Practice Residency in Kansas City. Um, I've, you know, you never, no one predicted we were going to be living through a pandemic, but um, all the training that I went through, my undergrad was in biology, and for a large portion of my undergrad career, um, my favorite classes were OCHEM and cell biology, and so I was like a teaching assistant and taught a bunch of stuff related to cell and molecular biology, so that was the stuff I loved the most. So as not fun as it is to live through a pandemic, like the nerd in me kind of enjoys learning about it as I go um, and helping other people understand it a little bit better so it's not as scary. Um, so can you just tell us how the vaccine works? Yeah, sure. So um, last time I did a little video about this, I made drawing like stick figures and they are awful because I'm not an artist. So I made this little printout to show first. So first, I think it's good for people to understand what our normal body does um, with our um, genetic material. So this is just a picture of a cell um, and DNA is like a double-stranded molecule. Your DNA stays in the nucleus of a cell, so cell, nucleus, DNA. DNA, it's a mo molecule, okay, changes into messenger RNA and then that RNA goes out into the cell um, and is made into proteins. So those are a lot of science words, but basically you have genetic material turned into a messenger. Kind of think of that as a piece of photocopy paper. The photocopy paper goes to the photocopier and makes a bunch of messages, makes a bunch of proteins. Um, the proteins, um, so in normal, um, in normal physiology, the protein is just like there's proteins that make up my nails, that make up digestive enzymes, that make up the pigment in our eyes. There's all different types of proteins. Um, the messenger RNA, which is again, think of that as the photocopied paper, it's just the signal, um, that is a very unstable molecule. It's very transient. So as soon as the photocopier um, makes the protein messages or the extra copies, like the messenger RNA itself goes away. So that's normal cell biology basics. So there's the two most commonly, I would say, used immunizations are called mRNA immunizations, and that's a fi um, from Pfizer and Moderna. And what they did, and this is where it was, I mean, it's just amazing what they figured out. Um, because the messenger RNA, which is the photocopy paper, is so unstable as a molecule, um, usually it just degrades and goes away as soon as you're done making the copies. So what scientists figured out how to do is to make it more stable so that they could then put that in an immunization, the Pfizer and the Moderna immunizations, give it to you, and that little messenger fuses, um, the immunization fuses with your cell, never goes into the nucleus or into your genetic material, but goes to the protein, like the photocopier, and makes a whole bunch of messages. And the, the message, the protein messengers are the antibodies that then help defend your body from um, actually getting a, a more severe form of the COVID, I mean, of the COVID disease. So, so basically it's teaching, the, the immunization teaches your body, here's what coronavirus looks like. Should you encounter it in the future, fight it off. Like don't, don't become sick from it and don't get severely sick from it. So there's a, one other immunization by Johnson & Johnson which uses 
a technology that I would say is an older technology. And it seems as though in the real world, it's played out that the Moderna and Pfizer um, using the mRNA technology is much more of a robust and longer lasting immune protection, um, upwards of like 90%, whereas the Johnson & Johnson is in like the upper 70s or upper 60s. So it seems that that newer technology really seems to be benefiting us more. Um, I've heard some people are hesitant because of it seems new, because we keep saying new, but really truly, um, so other RNA viruses would include um, Ebola and Zika virus, measles, mumps, rubella, those are all RNA viruses that are similar types of viruses to the COVID-19 virus. And they've been working on developing immunizations using this technology during Ebola, during Zika, um, at least a decade, if not longer, um, but it's never come to market because fortunately those viral, um, I don't know if they were have been called pandemics at that time, but th those virus outbreaks that we had were contained and, and dwindled and thankfully didn't become as broad spread as COVID-19 kind of has. So, so thankfully, I mean, it's the only time it's come to market, but that's, I think, why. Mm -hmm. So another question we get is, why get the vaccine when people still get COVID after getting it? Yeah, um, that can be confusing. Um, so they, so, so those, sometimes people refer to those as breakthrough infections. And I think that's just a kind of a misunderstanding. So when you get the immunization, um, it's not that you can't get the infection at all. It's that it takes what could be a really severe infection and turns it into hopefully a common cold or hopefully subclinical where like your body's fighting something off and you feel tired for a day or two, but it's you don't even notice because it turns it into nothing. Um, there's two really good studies that one from Denmark and one from South Korea, because there's questions about, okay, well, if I get COVID after I've been immunized, then what was the point? Well, you also thankfully probably won't end up in the hospital. You very thankfully very likely won't die from it. So when we say it's 90% effective, it is 90% effective at, at reducing your chance of being hospitalized, reducing your chance of death um, or significant, like severe, severe illness. So um, so there's, there's two studies I know of that they took someone who was immunized um, and swabbed their nose because they had symptoms and they were positive. And you take someone who's not immunized and they have, they're also positive. Well, that's they're both positive, so in that case, you kind of go, well, 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 now what was the point? Okay, well, if you take those swabs and try to grow and make a live virus that can then infect other people, when you had the immunization, like what they're swabbing that turns positive is kind of like destroyed virus pieces. So the tests are so good, you still turn positive, but when you try to grow a live virus, you're two thirds less likely to be able to come up with then a, another good virus that is gonna be as severe. So. So there was, this is maybe a month old, but there was, I know there was at least around 7,000 breakthrough infections. And then I think the question then became in those breakthrough infections, were they common colds? Well, that's success for the immunization. Like we want common colds, you know, that's great. <laughs> um, or, or those people who are severely ill, well, then we didn't make any progress. So, so that's why, and, and looking at, so like I kind of told you like Portland, Omaha, whatever. So in the last couple of weeks, I've reached out to my, like just friends, past acquaintances, people who are in training programs with me who do inpatient hospital medicine, everywhere from Alaska to California, Oregon, Nebraska, Kansas City, and just ask them like, who are you seeing hospitalized? And these are people who know, because you know, there's so much going on out there and so much that's out there, it's hard to know who to trust. And so I just reached out to my friends who are on the field, taking care of the people in the ICUs and the ventilators in the hospitals, and it, uniformly, it seems that the people who are hospitalized now are either um, have a lot of comorbidities, like a lot of kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, um, and they may be immunized or they're very old, or they're younger and they're not immunized. So it seems that there is a degree of, you know, I, I mean, the vaccines are protecting from the severe illnesses for the most part, um, and there's some contribution to how chronically ill or chronically healthy you are on a regular basis too. Mm -hmm. So what if I already had COVID? Do I need to be vaccinated? 
Good question. Um, so there is a difference between natural immunity and immunization um, given immunity. So the natural immunity, so if you get infected because you're not immunized and you get COVID, um, your body has an immune response and then you have some immunity for some amount of time. Similar to if you get immunized, you induce an immune response and you get some immunity for some amount of time. Right now, we are studying and trying to figure out what is the, how long does the immunity last for natural immunity, for immunization immunity. Really like the practicality of it is, so similar to if someone comes in and they are newly diagnosed with diabetes and they would prefer not to take medicines. I say, okay, well, here's your exit strategy. Like, here's what we can do to not have to be on medicines for diabetes. Like, as far as food choices, activity choices, lifestyle changes, those sorts of things. Um, when you think of a pandemic, from whether a local, like, per individual level, global level, the exit strategy is immunity. So you can get immunity naturally. You can get immunity with immunizations. We almost had eradicated measles and then blankets came over with measles and decimated populations of people. So I think we're on a way to eventually getting out of the pandemic. And it's a choice of, if you get the immunization, the chances are you reduce your risk of, you, you do reduce your risk of severe disease, illness, hospitalization, that's your ticket out, okay? Or you get it and un unfortunately you roll the dice about are you going to be someone who ends up in the hospital? You know, and I've never made my own personal health choices for political reasons, and I don't, I would suggest that other people do the same, only because those political reasons, like, may not be in your own individual best interest. Um, at Iowa Specialty, we're a, like, by definition, a rural critical access hospital, and in the past month, at least for the past month, um, we've had patients that we are now keeping who we would normally send to other hospitals for a higher level of care. But we call all the hospitals in Iowa and all the border hospitals on our surrounding states and we don't have places to transfer them. So normally if we're ordering labs on someone every four hours, like that's because you're pretty darn sick and we wanna see because things could get better, could get worse fast. Normally that person would go somewhere else. Well, we're now doing that care because we don't have the resources to put people where we would normally put them for this type of care. You know, we'll keep doing our best, but it's, I, I get that there's so much confusion out there that people are scared of coronavirus or they're scared of the immunization, but it is an exit strategy to get out. And we don't, while we're better at taking care of people in the hospital than we were at the very beginning and keeping people off the ventilators and whatnot, we still don't have enough room. And I think we've had a year and a half of people pushing off some of their normal health care. So now our systems are overwhelmed for the backlog of normal heart attacks and normal stuff that was brewing that maybe could have been managed when we were, if we were doing full capacity. So now we have, so it's just ending up being a bottleneck. And so patients that we could normally have saved, like I don't get a pick if there's an 82 year old who's ventilated and there's a 37 year old who needs to get in the hospital. I don't get to say you're 80, you had a life, so we have to make room for the 37 year old. Like in, in COVID, you just, what we don't know about COVID is we aren't able, and this is this would be great, right? We don't know for those younger people who get COVID and get a severe form of it, there are plenty of young people who get COVID and have a minor, minor common cold, but we don't know which younger people, like 30, 40, 50 year olds, are gonna get COVID and have severe disease. If we did, we'd just immunize those people. But we can't figure out why some young people get COVID and they're ventilated. So like, your strategy can be to get COVID, you roll the dice and you get a bad case and we have a bed or don't have a bed, but it's a, you're rolling the dice, you know? Or the other strategy for the exit is immunization because the chance of you getting severe illness will be so low. Um, so I think, I understand the political haze right now, and that is scary and I think inducing more fear, but it's still, in my opinion, not a good reason to make an individual health choice, okay? So. Mm -hmm. What about getting sick from the vaccine, either short-term or long-term? 
Yeah, um, so we've now been immunizing in the U.S. probably since February or so, um, and Israel and Great Britain, I believe, I know Israel for sure started immunizing probably three to six months before the U.S. did. And so, I mean, there's some benefits to that because we get to like look at the data coming out of their areas and see how they're doing. And um, it it seems as though um, the when people get the immunization, um, so for instance, when I got the immunization, um, my first, so I never got COVID, the first time I got the immunization, my arm hurt. Um, I did it on a Friday, but I mean, I had a normal weekend. Um, my second immunization, um, I got the shot again and I didn't feel great like within six to eight hours. And the next morning I just felt awful. And I felt really quite terrible for about a day and a half. I mean, like fevers, body aches, my arm hurt, like the ceiling fan hurt, like, to, like I was just down and out. So, but then, like I said, like the, the, the mRNA immunization, like that molecule's so transient, like it, the photocopies makes the photos and it goes away. So like literally the next day, it was Sunday morning, I woke up and I was like, I feel amazing. Like it just, it induced that immunity and it went away and then life got under normal so i was happy i timed it to get my second one on a friday so i could have a day and a half recovery um so there are some side effects like that people should in you know if you have the luxury of timing like which day you get it or when you get it um i would say by all means do that so that you don't have to miss out on a major life event because you feel yucky um but we see again now that the pandemic pandemic has been going on for eight year and a half or ish more I don't know um oh it's October yeah for a while um so I would say I see a lot more patients that have that are now coming in what, what we call long COVID which is they got over COVID I mean they didn't really get over it but they had the infection actively three months ago and they still have shortness of breath they still feel foggy headed they still don't have their normal energy levels so I'm not seeing long COVID vaccine, like I'm seeing long COVID symptoms. And I wish that, like, I don't, I don't think, at least I'm unaware, I don't think there's good data out there yet on long COVID, but I see it in my clinic so much. Um, I mean, I don't go a week without seeing at least a patient or two that's coming in because they still, still feel this since COVID. Whereas I've had a lot of patients that are immunized now that are coming in for boosters or coming in for their regular health checks who had COVID or had the immunization, you know, but they don't complain of long COVID symptoms in those situations. So, so you risk long COVID symptoms too, if you doing it the natural immunity way, I would say, unfortunately. Um, what else is I going to say about that? Mm, yeah. You see a lot of uh, patients in their childbearing years. Sure. What do you tell people about the question about sterility or if they're pregnant, if they should get it? Yeah. Um, so we give several other immunizations in pregnancy. So we give, so influenza is a RNA virus, just like COVID is an RNA virus and we give the influenza immunization in all stages of pregnancy. Um, the tetanus immunization, um, Tdap, which is the AP is actually pertussis, TDAP, so the AP is pertussis. So we always give that in the third trimester of pregnancy. There is um, something called vertical, and then there's something called horizontal transmission. So if someone has, say, let's say I have HIV and I have a baby, the baby can get HIV inside and that's vertical transmission. Like I have HIV and I give it to the baby before it's even born. Or it could be like, I have HIV, my baby's born without it, but then I give it to the baby afterwards. That's like horizontal, okay? So what we've seen, there's some studies now, there's one that had around 40 moms who got the immunization while they were pregnant. And almost all of those babies were born with COVID antibodies. So they're born with the protection of COVID from COVID already. That's literally the reason we give the pertussis booster in the last trimester of pregnancy, the last segment of pregnancy, is because we want them, those babies, to be born with the protection because they're too young to get an immunization to protect them. So, so the benefit for the mom is passing some immunity vertically, 
And then through breastfeeding, you can continue to pass antibodies to your baby that way for protection. Now, that's not to say we haven't seen kids get as sick or have as much death from COVID, but that doesn't mean our pediatric ICUs aren't also pretty full with a variety of other seasonal RSV, influenza, respiratory illnesses. Um, so, um, so for the pregnant question, um, I think if you're in childbearing years and attempting to get pregnant or you know, literally actively trying to get pregnant or become pregnant. Um, the other thing is like the studies um, that sh show that similar to influenza, pregnant people with influenza have a much, have a more severe course of illness. So when we look at the coronavirus data, pregnant women are like double as likely to have severe illness, double as likely to be ventilated, double as likely. So their illness tends to be worse when they have it. Um, so, so I think the protection is worthwhile. Um, and there's, again, now that we have a year and a half or a couple years almost of this going on, there's, I'm not a fertility specialist. I mean, I do outpatient OB stuff, but I'm not a fertility specialist by any stretch. There's some really good fertility doctors that are very, very evidence-based. And they talk about how they obsess over hormone levels and implantation and cycles and cycle frequency and regularity. And, and one of them I listened to said like, if there was something going on, like there's no way we wouldn't know. <laughs> She's like, we're obsessed with these numbers. We're obsessed with the data. Cause that's like literally their lifeblood is getting people to have babies. And she, so she's the one I'm thinking of. She's from Texas and she just talks about this exhaustively. And she's like, you got to get it. Like it's way safer to get it than to have the COVID infection. Um, so she, as a fertility specialist, has all of her patients get it. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Diamond, thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. I think this was really helpful and should help people to understand the vaccine better. You betcha. No problem. Yeah.